Good day. Nova Leap Health is an acquisitive home care services company providing a role in the continuum of care for the elderly, particularly focused on dementia care. The company just reported record results for both Q4 and 2023. CEO and founder Chris Dobbin is here to go through the past year and more importantly, focus on the outlook for 2024 and beyond. I'm Martin Gagel with Market Radius Research. It's Thursday, March the 28th, 2024. Please remember this is neither recommendation nor investment advice. We're here to learn about the company. Chris, welcome back. Congrats on a solid year and an excellent Q4. For new viewers, can you give us just a brief overview on Nova Leap Health before we get into the details of the past year and the, the coming outlook? Yeah, sure. I mean, first of all, Martin, I appreciate you having me back. It's always uh, I always enjoy the conversation and, and the questions. Um, I, I'll I'll give a, a brief overview of the company, and then uh, obviously happy to take any questions or comments you may have or others may have as as we move along. Um, I, I want you to think about Noble Leap Health Corp first as a as a home care services company, and you know what does that mean? So think about you know mom or dad or a, a grandparent or a loved one that is aging normally normally 65 plus and you know they usually have a chronic condition meaning a long term health condition that requires you know some some form of, of assistance in our business um about 75% of our clients live with some form of dementia and so that means you know their loved ones are are calling one of our agencies to go in and provide one on one care within the home and that care can be as little as you know 4 hours for a shift all the way to 24/7 care to, again depending on the needs of the of the individual and the family. So that that's what we do. We we um you know we go into people's homes and we provide service within the homes, activities of daily living, uh you know meal preparation, some cleaning, you know some errands, uh, doctors visits, um you know bathing, personal grooming, mobility issues, really anything that helps keep an individual safe is is sort of our uh, the priority that we have. Um, so I'll, I'll share a couple of slides uh, that I think will be, uh, you know, informative in terms of sort of where we've been uh, as a company. And I will say, if there's anyone in here in the U.S., like we're not in the Medicare and the Medicaid side of things. So we're, we're a private pay type of company. So the way that we bill is we bill on an hourly basis um, and it's out of pocket by the seniors we provide the service to or their adult children, depending on who's footing the bill. Now, we, we do also accept veteran affairs of VA or long-term care insurance, but um, for those that are used to, say, a government reimbursement program in uh, Canada or like a Medicare or Medicaid reimbursed program in the U.S., that's not the space that we play in, again, with the exception of, of veteran affairs. So I just want to make that clear. Um, so you should see the map here, um, and I put this as a reference point just to show sort of where we're located. So our head office is based in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where I reside. Um, we do have uh, three offices now in Nova Scotia. You'll see as we moved um, down towards the northeast of the U.S., um, we're in New Hampshire. We have four offices now in Massachusetts. We're in Rhode Island. Um, we do have a standalone office that's in South Carolina right now. Uh, we're in Kentucky and Ohio. And then as we move further sort of southwest, um, we're in Dallas, uh, two offices in the Oklahoma region as well as one in, in Arkansas. Um, and, and so those are the offices that we currently have just as a reference point. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions later on, sort of, you know, how did we end up there and when did we do that and timing and so on. And, you know, if there's a history of that and an explanation for that. And, and if that's of interest to people, um, you know, throughout the call, then certainly happy to, to take any, um, to provide more information on, on the strategy there. Um, the second one I think I'll provide as a reference point, a second slide, I, I think it is the financial profile. Obviously, this is a you know an investor type of um, you know call. So I, I your information. So I think people will want to see this. So we started the company back in 2016, and you know for those that are in Canada, we have the the Capital Pool Corporation program. It's a pretty streamlined way to, to go public. That's the way that we did it. So we we basically started with a. Um, and, I, and I reference this, by the way, for those that really have an interest in the company, I think if you refer to my March 7, I think, uh, shareholder letter, it'll give you a bit of a history in terms of where we've been to where we've come. But basically, we saw an opportunity to um, grow what we thought would be a fairly substantial organization uh, after, you know, our, my family had 
uh, home care as a result of my father-in-law who had dementia for a period of time. And so um, we went through that process and we started acquiring these small home care agencies. And we started in um, New Hampshire, then we went to Rhode, Rhode Island and Vermont and Massachusetts and, you know, more Nova Scotia and so on. That, that's kind of how we started. And so, you know, in, in 2016, I think we had $40,000 U.S. revenue. It grew to a million dollars. 2017, 10 million in 2018. And, you know, the growth was really coming because we kept making acquisitions. And at, at one time we were averaging, I think between 20, 2017 and 2017 and, and the end of 2021, we, we basically averaged one acquisition per quarter. I think there was one point between, I remember it was 20, 2017 and 2018, I think we'd made, you know, seven acquisitions in 14 months. So, you know, there was a time period there where we were quite inquisitive, really just, you know, everything was going very well. Um, you know, we were setting record results on a quarterly basis, both, you know, in, in revenue and EBITDA all the way to the end of really 2019. And then obviously COVID hit and we, we, we started to see an impact in our business in February of 2020. And you can see on the right hand side, you know, how that began to impact the business. So we we're sort of ramping up on the revenue side. Then we took a dip down during COVID. We started to go back up as we, you know, started to get the business a little bit more right sized during the pandemic. Then we did make three acquisitions towards the tail of uh, 2021. I think in, in a two week span, we, we acquired three businesses in December. And then it's been fairly level ever since, a bit of a dip. We had closed, um, we closed one office during that period of time, which, which led to a bit of a dip in the revenue side, but it was an unprofitable agency. And so it increased our EBITDA. Um, you know, I go back to trying to remember who did this quote. I think it was Bernhard and she years ago had a quote, um, you, you know, revenues for vanity, profits for sanity and cash is king. And, and we kind of look at it that way. You know, people often say, well, you're, you're, you're not growing because you're, uh, you know, your revenue dipped down over one year, but yeah, you're right. But how did we do from cash flow profile perspective? Much better. Matter of fact, the best we'd ever done. And so in as much as there was a couple of reasons why revenue had, de had decreased, you know, more importantly, dots or cash flow profile had substantially improved. And, and that was really what we were focused on. And I've tended to put out, um, you know, quarterly comments with, with our results. And I had said back at the end of 2022 that, you know, we had been struggling through the pandemic, particularly in a U.S. operation, and there were a number of changes that we had made. And, and I get that, you know, CEOs will often put a commentary there saying, you know, we're trying to right size and trying to change the business. Well, we, we did, in fact, change the business and did fairly well at changing the business. I think we we're up to the tune of 74 percent or so year over year in the U.S. operation. So, you know, the, the changes that we made, the way we looked at the business um, for us were very productive because uh, they led to very good results. And so so I, I think as long as people sort of know where we were um, or know, know where we are in terms of geography perspective, um, they understand that we were this company that was ramping up primarily through M&A. We, we hit a rough patch during the pandemic and we've come out of that in the strongest position we've ever been in. And now we have no, we don't have any bank debt, right? Because as we, again, for reference point, as we were making acquisitions previously, we'd either been raising equity or going to one of our going to our chartered bank uh, for bank debt, acquisition related debt. We paid off all those facilities, including one that was was paid off early. So, you know, we're a cash flow positive company um, that has a history of M and A, uh, a huge opportunity in front of us in terms of uh, M and A potential, and you know we don't we don't have any any bank debt. So. From my perspective, we're in terrific position. Um, you know, we we don't need to raise equity. We can avail ourselves to to bank financing for debt. Uh, we think there's lots of good opportunities out there. I wouldn't say there are as many opportunities that I'm seeing in the market right now as what I would what I would have seen in in probably two years ago. Um, but there's still lots of quality opportunities there for us. And so, um, you know, I expect this year, 2024, for us, we'll be back when we're, um, you know, when, when we make some acquisitions. So um, it's been a while since it, since the end of, of uh, 2021, but uh, I think this year is going to be a little bit different. So so as I look at it from an investor perspective, which I'm, you know, the second largest uh, holder in the company, um, you know, I, I think it's a pretty exciting time for us. I think, again, you know, we've achieved a certain level that we're at right now. And 
we're really trying to do two things. One is continue to improve where we are as an organization on, on the agencies we have, and two, to add um, successful M&A transactions on top of that, you know, like we've done in the past. So, you know, that's that's really where we are today as a company. And just to highlight, the, the last M&A you did was in, what, December of 2021 or near the end of 2021? Yeah, but that that M and A that's three transactions. So we we closed three separate deals in a two week span. So Friday, Friday, <laughs> Friday in December of twenty one. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's been over. It's almost uh, two and a half years since you've done some M and A. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, okay. That that's great. Why don't you just hi highlight uh, discuss the the last year? Maybe dig into a little bit of the last year and the last quarter and what kind of levers you were pulling and and that to uh because the revenues dropped but the margins expanded and the cash flow and EBITDA uh, expanded so how did how were you able to pull that off yeah so gross margins we've expanded and so we we tend to report on those again every quarter and so you, you can sort of go back over the period of each quarter or, or on an annual basis and you'll see there's been some margin improvement so I think when the pandemic hit and then and then inflation took hold, you know, there, there's always a concern of can you maintain your your margin profile? And so from our perspective, from a, from a gross margin percentage perspective, we've we've increased that over the course of the last couple of years. Um, so that's that's been good. And, and again, I think that speaks to the pricing power that we have within the market um, being in a private pay business, which allows us. Um, to set our our billing rates in accordance to the market conditions, I think is really important. And and I contrast that to like a Medicaid business or or maybe the Medicare business where you know rates are set um, you know based on different parameters, and so companies wouldn't have the same degree of pricing power as what we would have. So so gross margin expansion certainly has been one area that we've improved. Um, you know, to the expense management side of things. Um, you know, I can speak to that in a couple a couple ways. You know, we're we're looking at the financial profile, and again, if you if you think about you know a growing business, which we were, you know, certainly up until the beginning of the pandemic, you know, usually what companies do is they'll hire people, you know, in advance of when they may be needed as part of that growth, right? You typically try to hire good people. You know, growth is coming, and and so on. Well, you know. We, we got to a point where we were a growing company, but all of a sudden the growth kind of petered out a bit and then it we went down during the pandemic. And so we had positions that, you know, at that point in time, probably, you know, weren't weren't going to be as necessary as we thought they were because of we weren't going to achieve the growth we wanted. And so, you know, there were some, um, you know, some positions that were eliminated throughout the process. But the most important changes that we made we're in the U.S. operating segment. You know that's the one that had been hit most during the pandemic, and so that's the one where you've seen drastic improvements over the course of the last twelve months. And you know some of that has to do with agencies that maybe weren't performing as well as they ought to be, and so we made either some leadership changes. So no, nothing to do with like a cost cutting measure, but just you know sometimes changing people. Um, they may be a great person, but maybe there's a Maybe they're well suited for a different part of the organization. So we we've seen some of that, um, where if you have perhaps a different type of leadership style at an agency level, then that can lead to growth in a in a in a meaningful way. And so for us, we took some underperformers um, and ones that maybe were performing okay, but not as well as they ought to, and we made pretty significant improvements in a number of those agencies. And if you kind of think about it. You know, there's a, a bit of a portfolio effect in terms of, you know, how things sort of peter out with us. So, you know, we have all these different agencies and all these different geographies, um, some in rural areas, some in, in major cities, you know, some in Canada, some in the U.S. And at any given time, in any given month or every, in any given quarter, you're going to have an up or down. And, you know, that's one of the things that I alluded to within, um, you know, the shareholder letter was, you know, these are all small businesses on their own. Like we don't, we don't own any large businesses whatsoever. They're all, they're all pretty tiny and, you know, they're driven by the high hour clients. And so if we have a 24 seven client that's going to have a positive or a negative in, uh, you know, swing on the revenue and the profitability of the business. Right. 
And, and, and that's what happens on, on a regular basis, you know, throughout the year. But this portfolio effect is that, you know, if we lose a 24 seven here, then in all likelihood, we're probably going to get one here. It might not be the next day, but you know, we'll get one somewhere else in some geography. And so, um, you know, when we look at that type of effect, the main thing is that we should be trending in the right direction overall. And really that's what we were doing with, with our adjusted EBITDA. So, you know, just making some modifications to the underlying businesses and underlying agencies last year had a, had a dramatic, you know, Im impact on our bottom line. One of the challenges, especially during the, well, there are lots of challenges during the pandemic, but was the hiring uh, of people and uh, and everyone wanting uh, pay increases and and so forth. You're competing for with uh, government checks for employment. Um, how has that the labor and obviously the whole global economy is looking at labor and unemployment rates and so forth? How can you discuss the labor market a little bit? How how you're what you're seeing there? Yeah, look, I mean, it's I think it's always going to be challenged within the industry. I mean, we're always looking for for people that that it's a lot better than what it was. And I speak to this at okay. length and, you know, it's better than it was a year ago and, and it's better than it was two years ago. But is it as good as what we would all like within the industry? Of course not. Like it's, you know, we don't we don't have enough people to fulfill all the demand that exists within the market. Um, but that's that's just the nature of the business. Right. It, it'll, it'll be like that for the next several decades. Um you know, it's always going to be a challenge, but yeah, all I can say is it's a lot better than what it was. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, people, people wanted more pay and we dealt with that appropriately and we still were able to increase our gross margin percentage. So, um, as much as that was a challenging environment, I think we worked out, it worked out pretty well for us from that perspective, but yeah, look, we'd love to have more people for sure. We'd definitely love to have more people. And, and, and I've asked this question before, but that's the rate your, your rate limiting factor on the growth is if you could hire a hundred more caregivers you could fill their fill their capacity pretty quickly correct yeah you got it yeah that's that's our limiting factor that's the that's the that's the limiting factor to growth yeah yeah because yeah. what what normally with businesses i ask about like capacity utilization mm -hmm. and I, I guess if you're employed people that number would be pretty high but for an office that's just an admin office and they hire people and make sure they show up at their appointments and payroll and and everything that's an admin but you don't really have a a capacity constraint like you need to get a bigger office or a factor or anything like that you just have to hire more people to to fill demand yeah i so i think you can you can break down sort of the personnel within the organization into three buckets the first bucket is um sort of head office and like the accounting team, right? So, which is which is centralized out of Halifax. So, you know, we, we have a, a team of accountants that's providing sort of back office functions around billing and payroll and monthly accounting and our public reporting. Um, you know, they, they provide that service out of the Halifax office, right? And, and then you have people at the, at the operations level within a home care agency. Now, we could have as high as, you know, nine or 10 people in, in our largest office to, you know, two people in our smallest, right? And there's always going to be someone that has some sort of senior care background that's doing the in-home assessments. And there's always going to be somebody that's responsible for scheduling, right? And then, and then one of the things that I addressed in our shareholder letter, and again, you, you sort of look at you know, you know, just take the quarterly revenue chart that we're showing here. You know, we, we peter up, and then we sort of hit a level, we go up again, then we hit another level. And, you know, what we were finding is that with these agencies, you know, there's the natural attrition of the clients, right? They, they may pass away or, ha or have to go to hospital for health issue, whatever it may be. But the agencies that had sales personnel tended to fill that demand, you know, that we tended to bring people in quicker than when we didn't have the sales personnel. And so that's one of the biggest adjustments that we're making in 2024 is hiring additional sales personnel because they have the ability to go out in the market um, and sort of expand the relationships that we could have within that market. It's very difficult when you have someone that's doing in-home assessments, who's taking all the referrals, and, you know, working with the scheduler and dealing with the families and all the dynamics that happens there to be able to go out and market beyond, you know, the, the, their existing relationships. 
And so I'd say that's the biggest adjustment that we're making in 2024 is really investing more into the offices. Um, and so we think that that'll have an impact, uh, you know, going forward. Yeah, because you be, it might not be immediate. I you know I don't want I don't want to leave people the impression <laughs> that we hire a salesperson all of a sudden revenue has gone way up the next day. Or something, you know, re, you know, yeah. relationship building takes time. You know, getting out in the market, spreading the word. You know, for people that have been in sales uh, in, in the past, I mean, there's a bit of a rule of thumb that you have to sort of you know touch somebody seven times before they say yes, right? So again, I, I don't want to leave people with the impression that there's some immediate you know, huge uplift we're going to get just because we're, we've invested in sales personnel. That's, uh, you know, that's not the case. Um, but we do think that making that investment, that allocation of capital into those agencies will lead to better longer term results for those agencies. And when you say salespeople, given that your staffing is your rate limiter, are, are your salespeople there to hire new caregivers or are there, they are they there to uh, help out uh, more to find families to help out. No, to find families to, to help out. Okay. Yeah. All right. I, and then again, what do you do on the, um, on the staffing? Martin, Martin, I think just before you, like the one thing you got to realize is that in order, you're right that the, the caregiver base is a rate limiter. Yeah. But, it, but in order to keep them long-term, you have to meet the demand of the hours they're looking for. Some caregivers want 10 to 15 hours a week, someone 24, right. Or someone, yeah someone 40 hours a week plus overtime, whatever, whatever they take as much as they can get. And so if, if you, if you, if you're not bringing people in, if you lose a client that has an impact on them and yeah. you're not bringing in the next client, you know, quick enough, or you're not able to, you know, allocate their, their time to somebody else, then that, that lead, that can lead to caregiver turnover. So yeah. uh, the two go do tie in. So I don't want to leave the impression that, um, like the caregivers are a limiting factor, but you have to realize just how they think and what they're looking for for their own lifestyle too, right? So we have to address that yeah. on the other side. So it's really quite a balance there. You have to really match your your client marketing with your uh, employee uh, um, attraction. Yeah, exactly. And we look, we we have one agency. It's 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 unbelievable. They'll, they'll lose a twenty four seven client. They'll get one. They'll get one the next day. Yeah. Just because of the relationships they have with 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 you know certain certain third parties that um, they build up over time, the agency does a great job of looking after you know those referrals that come in, and that builds confidence, and then that repeats itself. Um, yeah. But we have we have agencies that don't have those types of relationships because they they haven't had the investment in for those types of positions, and so that's really what we're trying to address. Gotcha. Do you run, I don't know, radio ads or billboards or things like that? Or is it all sort of uh, personal relationship, uh, salesperson marketing? Most of it's personal relationships. It really is. Okay. I mean, have we done some radio ads? Sure. You know, very, very selected uh, radio ads and, and uh, some more during the pandemic when they were providing grants to do that. But um, yeah, it's, this is a very, you know, personal touch, right? It, it's, it's, you know, you think about, you know, you're bringing in someone into mom or dad's home or your own home or whatever it may be. And you've got to have the confidence that it's going to work out. Right. And because it's it's a, you know, it's an emotional time and it's an important time. And so if you know someone that is good at that, then you're going to you're going to go to that person. Right. And so, um, again, that's why it's, that's why these relationships with local market are so important. All right. Um, I want to ask about uh, with your shareholder letter, you have a goal of I believe it's getting your EBITDA increasing it up to um, 750,000 US dollars a quarter. Uh, so annually uh, around the $3 million US. Um, is that and, and you, you say you're going to be investing internally in your operations, hiring salespeople to to, to drive that. Is that all based on organic growth like that? Or does that assume some M&A as well to get it up to that 3 million annualized mark? No, it's, it's both organic and M&A. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so really we're trying to build on the base that we have right now. So, uh, you know, we finished at 1.4, but I think we were trending at like 1.7 when we ended the year thereabouts. Right. So if you sort of averaged the last, you know, or 1.8, you know, you average the last three quarters, whatever it was, but, you know, um, so to me, that's kind of the base that we're building off of. And so we want to grow that organically at the same time, 
because the debt profile we have, which is, you know, no bank debt, we can go out and we think we can acquire smaller businesses just with cash, like, like the smaller yeah. size ones. And then some of the ones that we've done um, that are maybe a little bit larger, um, you know, through a combination of cash and, and, uh, uh, and debt. So that's, that's what we're looking to do. Okay. Since you've brought up the, the acquisitions, let's dig into that part of your uh, growth plans. Um, you, 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 the, the M&A market, I guess you said is okay. It's not great. Um, could you, what's driving uh, that or have the higher interest rates? Has that, uh, and as well, not just how many businesses are for sale, the competition from other people wanting to uh, acquire these uh, can just round out the flesh out the, uh, the, the environment with this. Yeah. So uh, there's probably three things. So, so back at the end of 2021, you know, there was, I think, legislation that, that was being put forth in the U.S. that the capital gains rate were potentially going to be raised with the new budget, I think, as as in, you know, in, for 2022. So there seemed to be a push, um, you know, maybe by some of the brokers out there that were advising sellers that it would be best if they were going to be selling the, the sell in 2021 as opposed to waiting because capital gains rate. And so, you know, we, we saw a lot of activity and a lot of businesses for sale in, in 2021. Um, and, you know, obviously we, we alluded to the fact that we did the three in December. Um, and I remember one, one of them in particular was, was driven by that tax change. Um, you know, the interest rates obviously have an impact. I mean, just, Theoretically, as interest rates go up, valuations come down, right? I mean, that's that's the theory of it. Yeah. And you know, there there would have been, and and you know, I've seen the, this the case. We've had conversations with owners over the last few years. You know, valuations that they could have gotten, you know, in in twenty twenty one or even early twenty twenty two, um, you know, were were really high, and those those same valuations don't probably exist today. In the way that that they did, because the cost of capital is far more expensive, so so that that's a driver because you know people may want a certain amount or they may expect a certain amount for retirement and maybe they can't get that right now, so they're going to wait. Um, and then we've seen businesses that maybe you know aren't doing as well now as they were, and so for the same reason I just addressed, you know they they probably want a certain number and and they they recognize that maybe they can't get that right now. And so that they want to put more effort into building the business back to where it was to try to get closer to that number. So there, I think there's a few of those types of things, types of scenarios that are going on, but yeah, it's a lot of it's probably driven by valuation. Um, you know, in, in terms of acquirers out there, I'd say in the last few years, there's been, you know, sort of five or six kind of main players that have been buying up these private pay businesses you know, us being one of them, we've been one of the more active ones. Um, um, you know, some of that has pulled back. Obviously, we pulled back out of the market for a couple of years, you know, two and a half years now. Um, there's another large player, I think, that had pulled back quite significantly, and they were probably the largest acquirer, uh, the most active. I don't I don't know what if if they're as active now. I don't they're not as active now as they once were. Um, and so, we would often compete on businesses. And so sometimes that would drive valuations up a little bit, depending on, you know, if we really wanted it. So, you know, I, I, yeah, it's, it's all kind of driven by valuations a little bit. Interest rates are having an impact. Maybe people not doing as well as they were having an impact. Um, you know, we bid on a couple of businesses a couple of years ago that we really wanted. Um, we, we actually weren't the successful bidder. They, they went with somebody else, but the deals actually fell through. And and so we've sort of re-engaged discussions, but you know the valuations that they would have had expectation back then, and what they probably realistically could have achieved are probably a lot higher back then compared to where it is right now. So again, they're more challenging discussions, I think, when people have already been promised a certain number, and now yeah. now that number is not is no longer realistic, at least in the current environment. Okay. That makes uh, a lot of sense. I'm I'm curious 
the three acquisitions you closed in December uh, 2021, um, uh, was that was that a did you bite off more than you could chew there? Like, could, are you was that a, a manageable amount to uh, integrate into the business, or did that cause some indigestion? Let's say, let's call it. No, I mean we felt it was manageable. I mean we did we uh, otherwise we wouldn't have done it. Um, so we had a we had a team in place there that was always involved in the acquisitions. We have a post acquisition team, like a transition team, um, and those were in three different regions that we closed. And so we actually had three different you know uh, leaders within those regions. So it wasn't like we were putting um, you know three acquisitions onto one leader for that region. So. Um, yeah, I don't I mean we're happy with with those acquisitions. I'm glad we made them and and um you know, does it put a little bit more pressure on some of the staff for sure. Um but you know, certainly from my perspective, uh you know, we managed through it pretty well. All right. And in terms of the profile of businesses you'd like to acquire, um what, what's sort of the sweet spot uh, like a 2 million dollar a year business or uh, or, or ha ha discuss the size or the range of sizes you'd contemplate yeah i mean that that historically has been our sweet spot i think maybe the largest one we bought may have been closer to four million or something but i mean they, like they're they're small right i mean i think the average size of a home care business the last i saw was around 1.8 maybe 1.9 million dollars so you know other like that's kind of what these grow to in, in certain areas and yeah. um and so you'd say well why you know what's the point right like from a from a business perspective you know what's the point I, I don't mean from a service perspective and doing good in the community but as you as you look to grow a public company right and and again i think that you know the the viewpoint here is that we can take a good cash flow profile company even if it's only generating three or four hundred thousand dollars a year on its own right small business but if we're successful with that, then we can take that cash flow and then reallocate it to M and A, and then we can yeah. buy another one, which allows us to generate another three to four hundred thousand dollars, whatever the number is, maybe a quarter million dollars, once the debt's paid off, right? And then we just keep replicating that. So yeah. that's that's really the theory behind the model from from sort of an organizational or business case perspective. Yeah. Okay. And what about greenfield operations? Are you uh, contemplating opening up to brand new offices on your own? We are, although I'd say look, we're a little bit more cautious of that right now. Um, like, if we find a good uh, M&A opportunity within the existing region where we have a regional director, I would say that would be the preference. But there are certain cities right now that we're looking at that fall within a region where we are we may already have connections Right. Um, so a, as a result of people sort of um, having previously worked in those areas. So that's valuable to us, because if we can enter into a market where we've already done quite a bit of work on the relationship building, because those are existing relationships that have sort of transpired, you know, uh, just organically from previous work experiences, then those are certainly of interest to us. OK. All right. Uh, I think we've gone through a lot of uh, um, information here. Is there anything we've not addressed that's uh, salient or uh, you you want to bring up? You know, I, I mean, number one, the corporate decks on our website, so anybody can go and they can they can look yeah. at that. It's it's always there. Um, <clears throat> I, I suspect there's probably people on this call that have seen me present at a number of different events, and and so the story has been pretty consistent for the last number of years. I mean, there's been some ups and downs that you see on the, on the chart in front of you, but, you know, it's a pretty consistent story. It's a very, I think, easy business to understand. You know, and what's, what's really interesting to me is that investors that we've had for years, we actually now provide care to their loved ones. There are certain investors that have been with us for the last few years. Now they're at the point where their parents are aging and our agencies are actually providing care, um, you know, to their parents. So, you know, it, it's just, um, I think it's a, a really relatable business. I think it's an easy business for people to understand. Um, I don't think that's why people invest. I think people invest because 
you know, they think they're going to make money. Otherwise they wouldn't do it. But, um, you know, I think from our, from my perspective, we're, we're at a, we're at a really good spot. Again, I, I've talked about this in the shareholder letter. Like I look at levels, right. And, and, and you can kind of see that on the charts, you know, levels, they're leveling up. And, and I think we're in a position to, to move up the next level, um, you know, in much the same way that we've done that in the past. And, and, um, you know, if we can deliver that, then I think we, we have a very successful organization and, and, um, and that's what we're, we're trying to achieve. Excellent. Well, we've gone through all the questions uh, from the audience here. So um, any final uh, statements before we wrap things up? No, look, I appreciate the time. I appreciate the opportunity to answer the questions. And, uh, you know, I look forward to speaking at some point down, down the road. Excellent. Chris, thanks a lot. Appreciate the time. Congrats on the quarter. And uh, I'm, I'm very uh, curious and uh, interested to see how the coming year and years uh, roll out. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you.